And greetings. Happy Thursday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show. We are back live and on demand. And yes, you don't have to adjust your screen. I am wearing a coat and a tie. Don't get used to it. I've got a banquet. That's why I'm down here in Dallas. I had a couple of speaking engagements here this week in the Lone Star State, and I'm just too friggin' lazy uh, to go back to the hotel room and change. So I uh, just decided to wear the banquet clothes here. So feast! And gaze your eyes upon a sight rarely seen, me wearing presentable clothing. All right. So, yes, I am down here at the Posh Studios in Dallas. Aaron is back uh, in our uh, home base there in Des Moines. Good to see you, Mr. McIntyre. How are you? Doing all right. How about yourself? Doing better than Todd. Doing better than Todd. Yes. Mr. Anti-Vax finally got sick. Is this like his first sick day ever? Like, he's really sick. Like, sick enough that we don't want him anywhere near us. Right, so we told him to take tomorrow off too, and he got sick while on va- he was away earlier this week when we were gone, and has remained sick. And we don't want him anywhere near us while he is is when it, whatever desperate state that he is currently in. I believe this is the first time that Mister Anti Vax has gotten sick, Aaron. I I don't recall him taking. I remember him sick being day. sick. I don't recall him taking a sick day. I don't exactly. think that's ever happened. Yeah. Indeed. That, there I, were times that, I don't we think probably wish either. he wasn't here, but he came anyway. There, there were times he made us sick. That, that, that happens on a frequent basis, yes. But I don't believe this. Uh, I believe this is the first time he's ever called in sick. So uh, this is a momentous day. Uh, the, the seal has been broken. It's also a, moment, a momentous day because we have a brand new partner here on the show. First Cup Coffee Company. It's a Christian-owned Patriot coffee company that stands for core values like family and building community across the nation. Freshly roasted beans delivered in ground or whole bean texture pods. Bulk 11 roast profiles available. There's a flavor for every freedom-loving American, and they don't sell burnt coffee like Starbucks and the others. Uh, they're sold in one-pound bags. Uh, and shipped within days of being roasted. So ditch the grocery store coffee that could have been sitting on the shelves for up to two years. First Cup places the roast date on each bag, and we welcome them here. Firstcup.com. Use the promo code DACE. Firstcup.com, promo code DACE. We welcome them here uh, to the show. All right, we do have a jam-packed show uh, today. Uh, We're going to be joined here in studio by several guests while we're here in town. Uh, investigative reporter Steve Baker is going to be here with us with the latest muckraking on what is going on with the January 6th story. That's coming up uh, at the bottom of the hour. And I'm just calling it a story now. I don't I don't know what it, what it was. I, I don't know. Um, some people did some things. That, that, that line's been used before, I recall, in another context. Uh, so uh, we're going to discuss that with Steve. Next hour, a very special Theology Thursday that I know a lot of you have been waiting a long time for. We have gotten a lot of requests for this. And with Halloween just around the corner and the launch of the nefarious Bible study, Know Thy Enemy, Know Thy Enemy, a nefarious Bible study, guys, we got as high as number 23 overall on Amazon.com, like in the world, with a Bible study. I mean, that's incredible. All right. Uh, This remains the number one selling Bible study in the country. Yesterday, I've not checked this morning. I've been too busy. But yesterday, it was was the number one Christian book in the country. All right. So get your copy of Know Thy Enemy, a nefarious Bible study available at Amazon right now. Included in each book is a code where you can go to nefariousbiblestudy.com and either download or stream the videos with myself and Dr. Jeremiah Johnston from Prestonwood Baptist in here, here in Dallas, in fact, uh, as we give you uh, an introduction and a lesson uh, and, uh, in spiritual warfare and the unseen realm. Uh, it's a six-part Bible study. It, it's very highly produced by the people over at 110 Pictures. Can't thank you enough. It's been an incredible start uh, for this project that we just announced on a spur of the moment on Monday, and you guys have responded tremendously. So available right now at Amazon.com, Know Thy Enemy, a nefarious Bible study. Uh, I know you guys have uh, really embraced this project. You won't regret it. Know Thy Enemy, a nefarious Bible study is available at Amazon.com right now. Well, just in time for Halloween, we are going to finally go through and explain as many nefarious movie Easter eggs for you as we possibly can for Theology Thursday. We've got questions on Facebook and Twitter. I've got a list that we'll go through, and I will not do it alone. 
because another uh, we'll have another couple of special guests here in studio too. Because um, with a hit movie, with another hit movie, they decided let's get the hell out of California and stop paying taxes there. Uh, and so the team from Believe Entertainment is going to join us. Uh, our directors and script writers, Carrie Solomon and Chuck Consulman, they'll be here with us in studio later today at the top of hour two, uh, as we will go through some of the Easter eggs, as many as many of them as we can in the film Nefarious, and maybe describe some things and discuss some things that are not Easter eggs that I've been asked about as well. So that should be a fun conversation for Theology Thursday. And then uh, to close out the show, uh, Aaron, you'll have an in-studio guest. Uh, my oldest daughter, Anastasia, will be there for three non-political questions. Questions. So that's the rundown of a busy program. I am sure it will get going now with a busy rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by terrorists lie. After we left on Monday, the airwaves and social media pages were inundated with reports from Hamas that the evil Israelis had conducted an airstrike on an unsuspecting Baptist hospital in Gaza overnight Tuesday into Wednesday that killed 500 people. Despite reports before the alleged strike that Hamas was going to start barraging Tel Aviv and other targets once again with rockets, and despite the fact that there was ample video right away showing Hamas rockets being launched and one rocket misfiring before exploding on the ground, Mainstream media, multiple Democrats, and multiple Middle Eastern countries ran with the narrative that Israel had indeed bombed a hospital. Well, the sun came up on Wednesday morning, and wouldn't you know, there was no bomb crater at the hospital. In fact, there was no structural damage to the hospital at all. Instead, it appears the misfired Hamas rocket hit the parking lot of the hospital, destroying multiple cars and blowing out a few windows. Naturally, pro-terrorist activists stormed the Cannon House office building in Washington, D.C. yesterday, because in 2023, America, terrorist sympathizers do indeed have more rights than MAGA grandmas. In Lebanon, protesters attempted to storm the U.S. Embassy. In Turkey, Istanbul, protesters tried to storm the Israeli consulate. Joe Biden visited Israel on Wednesday, ostensibly to talk Israel out of doing what needs to be done to eliminate Hamas. On board Air Force One, Biden talked to reporters. I learned a long time ago that you all learned. If someone's going through something that is beyond their comprehension that they ever thought they'd have to go through. If they see someone who they think understands or maybe they through something not the same but similar. And I have no idea what he's talking about there, but later he did have some advice for the terrorists. I'm not suggesting that Hamas deliberately did it either. It's that old thing. Got to learn how to shoot straight. Back at home, Florida Governor and GOP presidential hopeful Ron DeSantis continues to stay on message when it comes to Israel and whether or not the United States should accept Gaza refugees. Earlier this week, Nikki Haley reiterated her stance that the U.S. can and should accept refugees. America's always been sympathetic to the fact that you can separate civilians from terrorists, and that's what we have to do. Before flip-flopping and saying she's never believed that. So you, you agree with Ron DeSantis? I've always said that. I mean, that's the last thing we want. One, because we don't know who they are. DeSantis responded. I'm willing to speak the truth. She's trying to be politically correct. She's trying to please the media and people on the left. Uh, I don't care about that. I'm going to speak the truth and let the chips fall where I mean, they may. Donald Trump finally went on the record this week saying he doesn't want any Gaza refugees, but is open to an ideological screening test for refugees who want to enter the U.S. Yes, the guy who couldn't ideologically screen his own cabinet when he was president is going to screen for terrorists. That checks out. In the U.S. House, Congressman Jim Jordan lost the first two speaker votes as of this morning. Jordan will not seek additional votes and will instead support efforts to give Speaker Pro Tempor Patrick McHenry additional powers till January. Former Trump attorney Sidney Powell, one of 19 defendants in that Fulton County, Georgia, RICO case over the 2020 presidential election, well, she's taken a plea deal. She's agreed to six years of probation, a fine of $6,000, $2,700 in restitution to Georgia, and to write an apology letter to Georgians. And finally, comedian Ryan Long. It's been a few days now. I still haven't weighed in on Israel-Palestine. I honestly don't know who to post. Usually it's easy. BLM, bang, Ukraine, bang, COVID, bang. Hey, did you do your Israel-Palestine post yet? I've never missed a stand. So who'd you go with? I look at my phone, I see a lot of Republicans supporting Israel. So I go, maybe stay away from that. Then I see a lot of the people we've been calling Nazis supporting Palestine. But then get this, the people that we've been calling them Nazis with are happy Israel's getting attacked. Riddle me that. But there really is no easy answer here. Did you do your Israel-Palestine post yet? No. What does your manager think of that? I'm retired. 
Oh, you don't have representation right now? Obviously, I was at the front lines of getting mad at Kanye West when he was doing the anti-Semitism stuff. Everyone was thanking me for standing up for the Jewish community. So naturally, I'm seeing this happen. I go, okay, we're back with the Jews again. I see Kylie Jenner post for Israel. I think, okay, the word's in. Then boom, she's getting killed on every angle. So it's not Israel. So I start doing a bit more research. I'm seeing queers for Palestine. And generally, you want to be on the side of the queers. If you look at the things, you're not going to get in trouble if you go with what the queers are saying. Then Mia Khalifa, who we obviously support, is posting with the queers. And she's getting fired from her job. The whole reason I'm posting this is to get in better standing with my job. And by the way, I started to see that your silence is noted post popping up. So we're running out of f***ing time. Here. And that's what happened while we were away. Again, not even parody. Aaron's montage brought to you by our friends over at Relief Factor. Everyone deals with, particularly as we get older, chronic pain from time to time. That's usually as a result of too much inflammation in your body, particularly in your joints. And if you can find a drug-free anti-inflammatory that will help and be effective uh, in helping you to live with less, maybe even without any pain, uh, take advantage of it. Not that there's anything wrong with drugs, if provided they've been fully vetted. Uh, a lot of miracles have been done with modern medicine in the last couple of centuries or so. But uh, understand that if you take them, there's a possibility, there's a reason to have all those disclaimers. It can put strains and, ta- and, and, and tax other systems and organs in the body as a trade-off. So if you can do it drug-free, take advantage of it. Relief factor, we think, is your option. And we're, we're going to say about 70% odds. That it is, because that's the percentage of people who try the three-week quick start for just 20 bucks and see such outstanding results in three weeks or less that they stick around and hang around and become long-term customers of Relief Factor. So what do you have to lose for 20 bucks to see if you might be the next Relief Factor success story? Uh, that's relieffactor.com is where you want to go, relieffactor.com, or you can call them at 800-4-RELIEF. It's just 20 bucks for the three-week quick start, 800, the number four, RELIEF. All right. So, by the way, yesterday's Evergreen, Aaron, I I mean, I got a ton of reaction in my inbox. People freaking loved that Evergreen yesterday. So wanted to thank all of you guys for sending that in. Really appreciated that. Uh, So you got an original show yesterday. You just didn't get a current one. And so we didn't talk about what happened uh, with another fail by Western media, particularly our own with the hospital in Gaza. Now, if you want to know what I think about all of that, I did discuss it yesterday on my friend and colleague Sarah Gonzalez's show, The News and Why It Matters. So I'd urge you to go and and check that out because we have breaking news right now that I do want to address. um, And I will in a moment. I will just add this postscript. They lied about Russian collusion. They, they lied about the origin of the virus. They lied about lockdowns. They lied about masks. They lied about the poison poke. They lied about the election. They lied about um, uh, <laughs> January 6th, which we'll talk about more here at the bottom of the hour. But you can totally trust their polls, guys. That's not an insignificant amount of people, by the way, on the right. That they're doing that math. One plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one equals 74. They would lie about all of these stories and they lied about who bombed a hospital in Gaza. But you can totally trust their polls. We're, we're, we're basically just like the, hey, you guys, guys on, in, on Goonies. That's kind of who we are. We can trust their polls, Aaron. But we can't trust them to do absolutely anything else. Is there a disconnect there or is there something? Am I missing something? Well, you're missing, obviously, Steve, is that uh, our meme game has never been stronger. So I think that's the missing. Clearly. So uh, we meme, therefore we am. Uh, and yes, I use, use those words on purpose. There is just, and it's continued now for two weeks. It's the very same players. Very same players. The media, as you just said, media got everything wrong on whatever happened on January 6th. They got everything wrong on COVID. The jabs, you go on down the list of every hoax they've tried to pull. The Hunter Biden, Russian disinformation, laptop from hell. But we're going to run with Hamas Steno- you know, stenographered uh, talking points about what really happened overnight while they were launching rockets into Israel. Now, obviously, obviously, her- terrorists have a great track l- record of telling the truth, don't they, Steve? We're just going to run with that. I saw so many on the right just run with that. And now they're, you know, silent. I- 
anybody anybody apologize for running with that by by the way? Not that I've seen. I've not seen anybody. Not that I've seen. No, are they are they still are they still examining the uh, the tint of the Jewish blood? Yes, and we're going uh, in the to, photos. Are, are we still we still examining that? Is this corpse of a toddler? Is is that actually AI? Is that actually a puppy that that the the dastardly Zionists actually uh, uh, interspliced there? It, it's yes. just a media so controlled. A media so controlled by five shadowy Jews that they immediately became, as you just pointed out, stenographers for Hamas. Yes. Go on. I'm sorry. Finish your point. Yeah. It's the Tower of Babel on the right right now. Yeah, yes, it is. It's yeah, the it mouth is. of hell yeah. on the left. It's just the mouth of hell on yes. the left. It's the Tower of Babel on the right. Is that, a, is, is that, I don't know, is that an environment where, you know, truth can be, uh, can be discerned, Steve? Is that, is, or even desired. In, in, even desired. I, I just every time I was I was driving for basically all of of yesterday and I get back and I see the drone footage of the hospital parking lot after there were scores of people, not just the me- mainstream media and the left, although I repeat myself, there were scores of people just claim, hey, it might have been it might have been Israel that did that did this might have been Israel that bombed a hospital. I see also that Nikki Haley is flip-flopping and then projecting her career in any sane world should be over right now. Honestly. Yes. After saying, and, and it is. And it, and it basically is. Well, I think we're seeing that it is. before our eyes right yeah. now. I mean, she is, she is on the defensive right now. But uh, good Lord, there is just, again, chaos. Chaos coming out of our mouths on the right. And then there's, uh, you know, Team Trump... Uh, wants to uh, make fun of the looks of of DeSantis's main spokesperson or main uh, response, rapid response director. I, it's just we're doing fine here, guys. Meme game, meme game strong, Steve. That is a perfect segue to what I wanted to discuss. Because breaking within the last hour, Jim Jordan has decided he will not force a third vote for Speaker after losing the first two. Now, there are a lot of you in audiences like what we have here at The Blaze because you're God-fearing, God-loving, America-saving patriots. You've been working the phones. You've been hearing the clarion calls. You didn't get one from me because I've been gone the last few days. But, I mean, hearing the clarion calls from the Glenn Becks and the others. And you've you've, you've gone to the mattresses. You have let that switchboard in D.C. and those inboxes in D.C. hear from you that we want Jim Jordan to be speaker. And then after two rounds, Jim Jordan puckers. That's one of the most Republican things I have ever seen. And, and now, he's, now there's talk he may go along with the Democrat plan for a speaker pro tem temporary speaker until January making someone speaker who was an elected speaker is the peel of our banana republic we're just out of laugh track and this is now where the, uh, the reality show breaks the fourth wall and just starts talking directly to you cuz the the jig is up here you have to start wondering at, I mean Kevin McCarthy How many votes did he force? I'll tell you how many. 15. 15 rounds of voting until Kevin McCarthy got what he wanted. Jim Jordan puckers and says, peace out. Pours one out after two. Forgive me if I'm now not wondering how would that guy have actually fought for anything as speaker if he's going to pucker after two rounds. Just puckered out. Like Davis, just like, you know, David Duvall back in the day, on the last day, on the last day at the Masters, having to play with Tiger in the red shirt. Just three putting every green. And it went in and you went in with a lead in the clubhouse and you lose by eight strokes. Just a friggin' pucker, man. And some of you owe my buddy Chip Roy an apology. Because what he said on this show three weeks ago is exactly what should have happened. See, he had a plan. He was willing to orchestrate it. If we switch speakers now, we will, we will start all over again, and we have only a limited amount of time to win this debt fight. We have at least some leverage with McCarthy. We can at least try to get something out of him, and if we don't, in 40 days, 
throw him to the wolves. But no, 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 this had to be done now. We had to storm the Bastille now. In fact, having a plan, you're the cuck. Having cleverness, having a scheme, you're the rhino. Okay, well, here we are. Hakeem Jeffries has gotten more votes for speaker the last two days than Jim Jordan has. And he just puckers out. People, people spending political capital, going to the nth degree. Everyday Americans like you who don't have time to be making calls and sending emails, doing it anyway, because you know the future is the country's at stake. And Jim Jordan's just like Doughboy at the end of Boys in the Hood, pouring one out. That's it. We're out. Go with the plan that's not constitutional. Are you freaking kidding me? Where's Trump's political capital that he can't even get a speaker elected within the Republican caucus, by the way? Ooh, don't answer, don't, don't ask that question, Steve. And Jim just taps out? Roberto Duran, no moss. After two rounds, we endured 15 rounds of voting. So establishment hack backed by Trump, by the way. Technocrat McCarthy could become speaker. After two rounds, Jordan just went French Foreign Legion. Surrender now before it's too late. Forgive me now if I'm wondering, what would that guy have done as speaker? What fights would he have waged? What gap would he have stood in? Two rounds, and he's out. And he wasted all of our time. This also, I think, maybe, I I doubt it will be heard, though, because we're in an era of tantrums. And emoting. And memeing, therefore I am, as Aaron said a moment ago. But for those of you in the, we just have to keep exposing these people crowd, For those of you in that crowd, we don't have that leverage now anymore either. Because did you see the pattern? Jordan got fewer votes in round two than he did in round one. Why? Because I told you you earlier this week and on social media all week long, and yesterday on Sarah Gonzalez's show, there are a lot more Republicans that don't want Jim Jordan to be speaker than are telling you. They just don't think they can tell you. And then when they went out there, and saw and, and survived the weekend and all the scrutiny and, and all the exposing. See, we just have to keep exposing these people, Steve. We just have to, no, we don't have to govern. We don't have to have a plan. We just need to keep exposing them. It's about exposing. And we, we expose these people. We will have, we create a critical mass of the American people, Steve, because we expose them and the people will rise up. I'm so freaking sick of saying, of hearing that. I'm just going to start punching people in the mouth rhetorically when I hear it every time from now on. Because that used to be the threat. That threat's gone now. Even more people on Tuesday were, or on Wednesday were like, well, sheet. We can all just come out now and jive talk now. We can all just say whatever we want now. Now there's no fear at all. Jordan puckered after two rounds. Trump throwing his considerable Cheeto Jesus saves weight around. Now they don't fear him. Now they don't fear you. We just lost all our leverage. But I know. Some of you in my inbox. Chips the Rhino! Matt Gates doing the car wash on conservative media to launch his 2026 gubernatorial campaign. People acting like he's a friggin' profile in courage. Here we are. What a joke. But it is emblematic of the era. Have no plan, have no scheme. Just reactionary, everything. As if reactionaryism is going to beat the long march through the institutions, coordinated, plotted, executed over decades. Books like After the Ball, written in 1988, that are now where we live, where they secretly trans your kids. But if anybody comes forth with a plan or an idea or a scheme, uh, hey, cock, we're emoting here. We're memeing here, cock. 
Johnny Maga's got uh, got uh, got memes to make about uh, Christina Pusha's uh, lip injections. What do you mean we need a plan? I'm over here examining. I'm, I'm over here looking at the uh, tint of pink of the Jewish blood on the internet. What do you mean we need a scheme? Fools! And we just got played for fools. This is embarrassing. Two rounds and a pucker. Well, without Jim Jordan ever being speaker, we now kind of found out what kind of speaker he probably would have turned out to be. This entire era, man. Sound and fury signifying nothing. That story going around yesterday about the Palestinian... Well, there's no such thing as a Palestinian, by the way. But the the quote-unquote Palestinian woman over at DHS who's doing the vetting of refugees for the Biden administration... Yeah, a lot of people sharing that story. Here's what they didn't tell you. She was actually originally hired by DHS in 2019. Aaron, who was president in 2019? Joe Biden. Exactly. Just foolish. Just, we just, what a waste of all of our time this entire escapade was. And now, now you're going to have somebody who did not face the will of the voters on any level at all hold the speaker's gavel. Gee, what kind of a budget negotiation do you think you'll get then? (laughs) <laughs> we suck we just suck it is time for the Jim Moore playoffs 2024 you think you know but you don't know and you never will we suck it is time to go back to basics it is okay to be smart It is okay to be clever. It is okay to be cunning. It is okay to be shrewd. It is okay to have a plan. It is okay to execute said plan. Or we could just keep doing what we're doing, Aaron. I think we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. At least that's... That's probably probably what's going to happen. All intents and purposes, that seems like that's what we're going to do because that's what we have done and that's what makes the money and gets the clicks and uh, gets our jollies off every night on social media because that's, that's really the depth that we have as a people. It's, it's not just the right. What, what makes it so frustrating, though, is that for, for my entire lifetime, the right has been portrayed as the, as the centuries of, of, of justice and the American way and, and the Constitution. When it turns out we're bigger jokes than, than the left, the purple-haired crazies on the left, because they actually believe the doctrines of demons that they spew, and then they act upon them. We don't believe anything. We say we do, but at the end of the day, we're just whitewashed tombs. There's no there there. Look really good on the outside sometimes if we're lucky. But upon further examination, we have have a lot to be desired. And that begins with the lack of desire for actual truth, which kind of brings this full circle. What we saw with the speaker fight, it was just, again, what we saw with the speaker fight, fight, pillow fight, was really what we saw from the Republican Congress before Mitch McCarthy, or I'm sorry, <laughs> Mitch McCarthy, uh, Kevin McCarthy was ousted. You had it right the first time. Yeah. You had it right the first time. W- yes. It, it yeah. was just a pillow fight. Again, we were asking, what was accomplished by a Republican-controlled U.S. House of Representatives? We got a lot of clicks. We got a lot of sound bites. What was accomplished Matt by Gates ousting? Matt got to do a lot of interviews. We got, uh, we got Kevin McCarthy ousted. What was accomplished? We got a lot of sound bites. We got a lot of clicks. Great. What's next? Yep. Cuck! That's, that's how we operate. Yes! Yes, that is exactly right. That is exactly right. All right, back here on the Steve Day Show, you know, there will come a day when we won't have to do these sorts of promotions for friends like Preborn anymore. At least uh, we hope by God's grace that will th- that such a day will come. But uh, today is, is not yet that day. Uh, and that's why they still need our help. 
because they're out on the streets uh, helping um, both mothers and their children uh, to avoid the curse of abortion. And what they have found over the years with their grace and truth approach is about 80% of the time uh, when they confront that mother with the truth that the child she's carrying is its own living person. It has its own distinct heartbeat. She hears it with that ultrasound. About 80% of the time over the years, they have found that she won't go through. Her conscience has been convicted. She won't go through with killing her kid. And that's, uh, those are phenomenal odds. And you know what? It's just 28 bucks for one of those ultrasounds. I mean, would you, would you donate 28 bucks for 80% odds that you're going to save a life? I know there's a lot of people in this audience that would do that. But they also understand that, hey, if you're a woman in a secure, healthy relationship, you're probably not considering an abortion. It's women who aren't that are. And so that's just the first part. Now they confront them with the truth, but then comes the grace and they're there both with pre and postnatal uh, care counseling, uh, even things as practical as a baby formula, car seats. Uh, and all of that is free of charge as well, provided they have enough tax deductible donations from people like us. So if you want to help this outstanding pro-life ministry at preborn, go to preborn.com slash Steve. That's preborn.com slash Steve. Uh, or you can dial pound 250 on on your mobile phone and use the keyword baby pound 250 on your mobile phone keyword baby or preborn.com slash steve let's welcome in blaze tv contributor steve baker is here with us good to see you again brother how are you hey steve good to be back with you <laughs> so uh, we were watching the unraveling of another media narrative after what we saw with the hospital bombing in gaza this week mm-hmm. uh, and that is what's been happening with january 6th I don't even know how to describe it now. Before we get into the latest developments, I want to kind of just ask you a big picture meta question. How do we describe it now? What, what is it? It, it? it clearly wasn't an insurrection. It was, there was some form of rioting. There's some form of, 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 of false flag, some form of instigating, uh, some form of realpolitik here. I mean, it, 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 it's a goulash to me. What it is, is it? It is. There's a little bit of all of that mixed right. in. I mean, right. for, first of all, Bear spray, flagpoles, and a couple of sticks does not an insurrection make. Let's just. <laughs> what, mean, what about people from uh, screaming for a, a, a Palestinian caliphate in the Capitol Rotunda yesterday? <laughs> does that make for an insurrection? You think? Or? It, it, it's it's only comparable in the fact that there was an occupation of a building Indeed. that they're not supposed to be in. Yeah, and and the only thing, the only real difference between the two is that there were COVID restrictions at the time of mm-hmm. the J six quote unquote insurrection. Mm -hmm. So the building was locked down. It was closed. Mm -hmm. And then otherwise that would have been open to the public and we wouldn't have all of these uh, uh, trespassing charges, uh, the glorified trespassing charges that we see uh, that are being applied to over a thousand people so far. So you've been on our show before. You've been on Glenn's show several times. A lot of our audience knows about you and the work you do. But for those of who may not know, kind of reset for us who you are and how you got into this story. Well, I got into this story on January 6, 2021. I was there. I was there covering the event. I had mm-hmm. my camera, I had my microphone and my tripod, and I went there to capture what was going to happen that day, not expecting or certainly not anticipating what ultimately transpired. That was uh, a surprise to all of us. But when the story did go that direction, I, w- I managed to capture a lot of that on video. And that video has been used uh, in news services and documentaries all over the world. Uh, clips from my videos have been. And then, of course, I got to the point where uh, the, the FBI finally got around to me, uh, interviewing me about what I was doing there that day. And then ultimately they decided that they were going to, in fact, press charges against me, which they have still not followed through with. We've been uh, 23 months now, 24, it's been 24 months since my FBI interview. And it's been 23 months since a U.S. attorney notified my attorney that I would be charged within the week. It's been a long week, Steve, Hmm. 23 months of waiting and wondering if that was going to happen or not. So during that time, I have thrown myself into investigating all aspects of this. And then in the process of actually doing a series on the Capitol Police itself, I stumbled into some things that led us to where we are today. Hmm. Where are we today? We are at the point right now beginning to reveal uh, conclusively, irrefutably, beyond any shadow of a doubt that there are testimonies taking place from Capitol Police officers in trials that are, in fact, perjury. Can you give us some specific examples? Absolutely. Uh, We rolled out two weeks ago. Uh, We had to do it in print because 
on the very night of the release of this story about Special Agent David Lazarus. Now, he's a special agent of the United States Capitol Police, not the FBI. But he's on the dignitary protection detail, and he was assigned to the protection of the Speaker of the House. He had worked for John Boehner, and now, and for six years up to the, January 6th, he had been working for Nancy Pelosi on her dignitary protection detail. And in his particular circumstance, he testified in the first Oath Keepers trial that he witnessed this interaction between the Oath Keepers and another officer by the name of Harry Dunn, whose book I'm obsessed with right now because it's coming out in five days. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute if we have time. But I, I noticed something covering that trial myself that did not sit right with me in his testimony. Couldn't figure out what it was at the time, but once I captured and got a hold of the the trial transcripts and reviewed them mm -hmm. and then began to review the video. And as you know, I've had, I'm one of those few uh, initial uh, journalists that had access to the 41,000 hours of Capitol CCTV. Mm -hmm. Well, on the night of the release of our story about Agent Lazarus, we lost our Speaker of the House, which meant I lost my ability to release the video because we had to have the McCarthy's per, It's uh, okay. We're, we're getting an ideological upgrade in Jim Jordan. No, wait. He actually just quit <laughs> an hour ago. Just, just did, punted oh, after he? two I'm rounds. Just, yeah. So we had so McCarthy was able to stand there for 15 rounds. Jim Jordan just puckered after two. But I digress. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so this is a master plan. So we clearly plotted this out. We planned this out. We <laughs> Very cunning. Very strategic. I mean, this is seven-dimensional chess here by Matt Gates. So Absolutely. go ahead. Ap yeah. Apparently. Yeah. So we had permission uh, through the McCarthy regime to release these videos, and we lost that. I got a call in the 11th hour two weeks ago saying, you can't release the video to your story. I'm like, what? We, it's, it's ready to go. I mean, at this point, the Blaze right. editors were putting the final touches on it. Yeah. And, uh, and I said, yeah, we can't, we can't do it. So I got permission to release one still shot, one photo. Uh, from the uh, the gatekeeper there with the committee, a uh, uh, congressional committee. And then we've been sitting waiting for a new speaker so that we can get back to releasing these stories. But here's what we do know, Steve. We know that Agent Lazarus, by virtue of the evidence that we have presented in our story, time codes, camera numbers, that he was nowhere near this event that he saw. He claims that he saw Harry Dunn in a contentious, highly um, negative re, uh, interaction with the Oath Keepers uh, just outside of the, the Capitol Great Rotunda. And, of course, we know that from other video that that's not exactly what happened that day. We know that the Oath Keepers lined up and protected a very volatile um, guy that was about to crack. In fact, he had already cracked just a couple of minutes before in a situation downstairs. We have other video of Dunn losing his you-know-what mm -hmm. uh, in the Capitol. Uh, we have about three incidences of that that we have um, harvested from the Capitol CCTV. But in addition to Dunn's story about creating or, or having this negative interaction with the Oath Keepers, they needed somebody to come in and bolster that and kind of clean up the story a little bit because Dunn had a problem himself. He had two FBI interviews. The first one... He actually gave a positive account of his interaction with the Oath Keepers. That was in May of 21. They brought him back in in, in August of 21 and said, you need to clean this up, Harry. And so he flipped the story, made it a negative interaction, and then created a second event <laughs> so that he could justify his misremembrance. So, so, they, so, so the, the Department of Justice FBI had a problem that they had to clean up. So they brought in this guy from Nancy Pelosi's dignitary protection detail, and had him claim in trial, in the tri transcripts, that he passed by that interaction between Officer Dunn and the Oath Keepers three or four times, is exactly what he said in the trial, while he was rescuing 11 or 12 of Pelosi's staffers out of their offices. Except, Steve, it never happened. I'm shocked. Dunn was having that interaction with the Oath Hold Keepers. Hold on, let me take off my mask to yeah. say that. I'm shocked. Go <laughs> You're ahead. shocked. Yes, yes. yes. But Lazarus, unfortunately, was in the tunnels. He was actually at the beginning of the Oath Keeper interaction, the actual moment that the Oath Keeper interaction began with Harry Dunn, where the Oath Keeper stood a line in front of Dunn and held out their hands and protected him from some of the more agitated protesters. At that moment, Agent Lazarus was in the Senate office buildings across the street, across Constitution Avenue, and we have it on camera. 
that's called like a reverse alibi, basically. Huh. That it, it, he his his story doesn't check out of his, of of his heroism and what he witnessed because he wasn't he wasn't there. He wasn't there, and then we tracked him all the way through the tunnels, tracked him back up into the. And you've the seen all this surveillance uh, footage yourself. We have it. Yeah. We have it right here in this building right now. Wow. And he didn't and so arrive. The, the, I just want to make sure everybody understands. Because, yeah, this one's a little personal to me. <laughs> because one of my best friends is Congressman Shiproy. And he came on here a few weeks ago to say, I don't think it's the right time to do this. We have some leverage with Kevin McCarthy right now. We have a limited budget negotiating window. If we lose that window, we're out until next year. And they get all the funding and everything they want. We should go to that. We should finish with McCarthy with a proverbial gun over his head. Get as many concessions out of him as we possibly can. Mm-hmm. And if that doesn't work... In 40 days, when that window is over, we get a new speaker. But nope, we had to act out now. We had to launch the Matt Gates for Governor campaign for 2026 right now. Right. All right. And so we're sitting here in the building that I'm in right now with the footage to show you what a scam much of what you've been told about January 6th and are still being told is. But we can't show it to you because we had to launch Matt Gates' gubernatorial campaign. Because I, I don't know what else we did with this, because all we did was call your call your congressman. We want Jordan. We want Jordan. Get in your inbox. Only for Jordan just to wave the white flag and, and, and surrender this morning. And so that's the, that's the reason why people aren't going to see this now is because we don't have the clearance to show that footage. We hope to get it. I am working. Uh, we talked about it last time I was on the show with you. I am working with congressional uh, committee members. I'm working with congressional uh, committee investigators. Uh, this is on their radar. This is actually we do have we do have some heroes there, but uh, unfortunately they're not in decision ultimate decision making uh, capacity or, or positions. But they want this. How out. much of this is exculpatory for people that are facing criminal prosecution right now or, or already prosecuted? I, I will tell you that when we roll the the entirety of what we have out yeah they they need to swing the doors open so of this, prisons I, for I'm, some I'm, of these guys steve i'm gonna lose my you know what so you mean to tell me there are people in prison right now or detained right now or being threatened with criminal prosecution right now and in this building there's exculpatory evidence that would clear some of those people but for whatever the hell this was for the last couple of weeks this clown show where now we're going to put someone who wasn't even elected speaker speaker which is the appeal to the banana republic we currently live in those people are still going to sit there and rot because we had to go through whatever this farce was of the last couple of weeks i'm telling you right now i am speaking via email to prisoners that are in prison right now because of these two Capitol Police officers' testimonies. I'm speaking every day to their attorneys, and we are waiting on the release of this video, the permission to show it right here on The Blaze. So how do you not lose your mind? Because I'm about to lose mine, and we've only been talking about this for 10 minutes, man. You're doing this all day, every day. <laughs> How are you so composed? And I want some of that, okay? Because well, I'm a, I am about to have head meet desk right here over Because I, I've, already, I've already been there where you are. I've been working on this story for a solid year. I started on this story on October 3rd of last year. And so I've had these moments that you're having right now already. I've shed tears over this I've cried with the prisoners. I've cried with the attorneys. I've I've actually had my moments of, of of breakdown with other journalists who have I've been friendly journalists from other media agencies who have been working with me on this. How confident are you we're going to be able to release this footage? <laughs> we have it, Steve. We can go nuclear if we want to. Now I'm trying not to. Because there's more stories to be told, and although we've harvested our the, the the camera numbers and the time codes, there are other stories uh, backed up by video that we don't have those transferred to those mm-hmm. to us yet. We have the notes on them, mm-hmm. as I said, we have the camera numbers, we have the times, but we still need that. So we're still, you know, politics are politics, and we're having to we're having to work through that and and to be affected. To have this story, story, this thing that I've been working on for a solid year, affected by what's happening at Capitol Hill right now is maddening. Which just amounted to absolutely nothing in the end, which has to make it worse. Maybe if you come out of a messy process and you get somebody who's an ideological, clear ideological upgrade over McCarthy, you'd okay, fine. It was a two week bump in the road. Fine. But now, now it's an it's it ended up being an absolute nothing based on what we're being told right now. All right. I've got about 90 seconds. What can you tell us? 
that you are that you can say about what people will learn that they don't know yet about this based on the footage we have? After we finish with Special Agent Lazarus, then we're going here. This book comes out by um, Officer Harry Dunn in five days. Mm-hmm. We have had a pre-release copy for a couple of months. Uh, I have poured over it. I have poured over his congressional testimonies. I've poured over his trial testimonies. I've poured over his media appearances. Mm-hmm. And the unfortunate thing for Officer Dunn is that when we release a day in the life of Harry Dunn on January 6th, it will contradict every single thing he has ever said about that day. Unbelievable. I just... And and they knew this footage existed. They were just this confident that it would never get out there, that they could just tell any lie that they wanted to tell. I talked to one of the highest ranking Capitol Police authorities. <laughs> I'll just say it that way mm-hmm. for now, two nights ago. He said 100% absolutely impossible that the Capitol Police themselves do not know what's coming. Right. That they do not know what we're doing. We already know that the Department of Justice and the FBI know what's coming because of their personal threats against me and from our sources inside the DOJ who have told us that they know what's coming. Steve, thank you for the work that you're doing on this man that you have done uh, for the courage you've shown. And uh, I mean, you're not alone. A uh, friend of the show, Julie Kelly has been out there on this story from mm-hmm. day one as well. And she's been on our show a ton talking about it. And, uh, I, I just, this is the most frustrated about a frustrating topic that I have ever been. And the, we've done as many interviews on this maybe as almost any other show has. And I just, the idea that there are, there, there is evidence available that would potentially free people from persecution or prosecution. But because of the clown show of the last couple of weeks that has not gotten out there yet, I just, I'm flabbergasted. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate Thank it. You. How can people quickly, how can they follow the work? Uh, right here on The Blaze or at uh, my X account, which is <laughs> at TPC for USA. At TPC, the number for USA. Great stuff, man. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. We'll come back. A very special Theology Thursday about those nefarious Easter eggs next. All right, back here with Hour 2, live and on demand. I'm here in Dallas at uh, Blaze TV HQ. I think I have calmed down at least a little bit after that conversation with Steve Baker. Back there in Des Moines is Aaron McIntyre producing the show. Todd, I think, just took his first sick day ever. (laughs) So the anti-vax guy finally took a sick day on the show after uh, seven years. He's finally too sick to come in. So it's uh, it's just the two of us here. No, if you're just tuning in, I didn't lose a bet. Uh, and don't get used to this. I'm speaking at a banquet tonight here in Dallas. That's why I'm in town, and I'm just too damn lazy to put on another change of clothes. All right, I'm only getting dressed once a day. All right, <laughs> true story. I'm I'm not doing it again. I'm just too lazy. All right, so I just put the banquet clothes on now. All right, so uh, you guys can gaze upon a sight rarely seen. Uh, me in a in a coat and a tie it doesn't happen very often, and you usually have to pay me a lot of money or be a relative of mine getting married uh, for that to occur. Those are usually the only two uh, times that that happens. All right. So we are back with hour two here on the show. It'll be Theology Thursday in a moment and a conversation I know a lot of you are looking forward to. Three non-political questions coming up at the bottom of the hour. Don't forget that uh, you can like us on Facebook, me, we, and Gab. You can follow me on st- over at uh, Twitter, uh, Getter, Instagram, and TikTok, at Steve Day Show there. That's D-E-A-C-E, at Steve Day Show. And uh, if you are a podcast listener we appreciate you so much you're a big part of our audience please if you wouldn't mind show your appreciation for us as well leave us a five-star review if you like the show we would never ask you to lie all right and now some of you might say well what if i just think the show's okay well then we would ask you to exaggerate i'm totally okay with that (laughs) i I don't have a problem with embellishment whatsoever Uh, i just want you to tell a a flat-out lie but if you're just thinking the show's okay then we would ask you to just go ahead and go right to a five it would help our egos and thank you to all of you that have uh, issued those five-star reviews as well and then uh, don't forget to subscribe and follow if you're on itunes that way every time we do a new episode it shows up in your feed every time we do one and again thank you to all of you that have done both of those things for us i i am reliably assured that that is very beneficial here in the age of the algorithm i have no idea how or why and i'm 50 now so i don't want to know and nor do i care all right but i'm just going to say it anyway because if it benefits me then i kind of care a little bit uh this portion of the show brought to you by our friends over at pure health research 
Uh, your liver is a very important organ in your body. How important? Well, it helps to be a part of roughly 500 key functions in your biology. That's pretty important. Now, as we get older, though, get a lot of tread on those tires, whether it's our eating habits, whether it's medications, even things as benign as Tylenols. You know, uh, decades of usage, that piles up, all right? Uh, still about one out of every five Americans smokes cigarettes. That can do it as well. Maybe you're taking a statin because you've got high cholesterol. That can do it as well. All right, so you want to make sure that you are giving your liver the help that it needs so it doesn't become a fatty liver because that increases your odds of heart disease by about three and a half times. And heart disease is already the biggest killer in America, so we don't have to increase the odds of that. All right, so that's why you're looking for the liver health formula. It's an all-natural supplement containing 12 clinically proven botanicals that helps to recharge and protect your liver and it's manufactured right here in the USA and approved by American doctors. You can try the liver health formula and receive a free bottle of nano-powered omega-3s to keep your heart healthy as well when you go to getliverhelp.com slash Steve. That's getliverhelp.com slash Steve. Make sure you claim that free bonus gift when you're there at getliverhelp.com slash Steve. Well, it has been um, six months since the release of the movie Nefarious. I haven't checked in a while. I've been so swamped. I looked yesterday. I think it is still the number three horror movie on Amazon as we speak, as we as we approach Halloween. Uh, I mentioned to you guys at the top of the show the Nefarious Bible study that we launched on Monday. Uh, it went to as high as number 23 overall on Amazon. That's like everything, like in the world, which is crazy for a Bible study. Um, and it's it's great timing for us to have this conversation today. Uh, it, a lot of you consider this to be spooky season. And we did make a horror movie, just not in the traditional sense of the word. This one's actually real. The, the, the horror is real. And it's something we're watching play out all too often uh, in our news on a daily basis these days. But within that movie uh, are a slew of Easter eggs. But things that I think some of you think are Easter eggs that are not. And this conversation has been requested for many times since the release of Nefarious. And today, with Halloween just around the corner, I kind of thought today was the day. Plus, I'm here in Dallas, and uh, the team at Believe Entertainment got tired of uh, paying Gavin Newsom's travel bill. So they moved to Texas as well. So my directors and screenwriters are here, uh, Carrie Solomon and Chuck Consulman. Good to see you, gentlemen. How you been? Very good. How about you? Hi, it is, Steve. We've it, been great. It is great to see you guys. How's life in Texas so far since you moved here? Awesome. I describe Texas this way to people that don't live here. I've suddenly entered a contest of who can be the nicest person in every social encounter, and I always lose, and that's fine. <laughs> it's, just, it's just absolutely A different absolutely level of amazing. hospitality, is it? Unbel- well, we go into our bank. We found the perfect bank here. I'll give a shameless plug for them, First United. And their motto is spend life wisely, and they have a prayer meeting every uh, Wednesday morning uh, at 8 a.m. for their staff, and customers are welcome. I mean, this does is not a, happen in Los Angeles. Doesn't Angels? happen, you no, know, not in L.A. No, no. not in L.A., no. Um, what about you, Carrie? How do you like it down uh, here so far? I, I think it's the way America should be. God, family, country, traditional values, everything's strong. You get the feeling like they're very nice to you, but you also know if you cross that line— Everybody strapped. <laughs> yeah, they, you don't want to go there. <laughs> it's yeah. the cowboy so, mentality. Yeah. Go identify and see if you need to kill it or not. That's right. I love that. I think it's, it's, it's America, and I think it'll be the last state standing. Yeah. Given the trend line that we are currently on, I'm, I am there's, – there's going to be a, st- a list, a very small list of states, given yep. the trend line we are on, for sure. Well, that's, that's one of the reasons why we made this movie, um, the, the way that we made it. The, the movie is, and I, I've told people this in all the interviews I've done about our film for the last six months, it, the movie is a, is a 90 plus minute provocation. It's a provoking, basically. And, and two streams of people are being provoked. Um, the believer, for example, when, when James says, I didn't know this was a fight, and Nefarious says, that's why you're losing. Right. The believer is provoked, but the unbeliever is provoked as well uh, to first acknowledge to be forced to acknowledge at first that there is the existence of evil in the world. And therefore, that evil must have a source. Right. And that that source can only be two things. It can only be in us or outside of us. It can only come from two places. All right. And 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 if your answer is what comes from both places, well, then that begs further theological questions. If it comes from an external source. Right. Then that would beg the question, is there an external source of good? And if it also comes from within us, well, then that would beg the question, what is wrong with us? 
that, that we would want to do evil? And then what would be the fix for that? I mean, what would be the cure for that? Uh, what would confront that, uh, that instinct? And the, the amount of notes I've gotten, guys, over the last six months from people. I mean, just I, I did, I'm down here to do two speaking events. I, I did one at a very, very, very nice well-to-do home in Fort Worth late yesterday, kind of a private gathering. And uh, the amount of people who came up to me about our film that had seen it uh, was almost everybody in the room. And I had one woman come up to me, and she's on the board of Texas Values here in the state. And... And she was telling me that uh, she got her son to watch our movie, and she just thought what you guys did, was, he thought, was, was so terrific that it, it, it just it renewed his interest in, in spiritual themes. And, and, and then she told me that uh, for the first time ever, he has agreed to do a Bible study with her, awesome. and it is the nefarious Bible study that we launched on Monday. Awesome. And, and the amount of, st- of those stories that I have in my, I mean, I've got an entire folder saved in my, in my email. In my stevedace.com email, and I mean, there's, a, there's thousands of emails in there from people with these kinds of stories, you know? And so uh, we haven't had a chance to on the air to talk much since the movie's release and to kind of look back on everything uh, that uh, the film has done and accomplished and everything else. But So I wanted to make sure before we got into the Easter eggs that I, I had a chance to say that to you guys on the air. I mean, well done, good and faithful servants. Praise God. I mean... Just amazing what's mm-hmm. happening with the movie. Hopefully it pleases the Lord. I mean, we were, you know, part of the whole deal with this is we were like, uh, I, I sometimes compare guys who are making movies, writing scripts to old ladies who make quilts, you know, and you pull it, mm-hmm. you you go through and you, you, you get all these little uh, squares of fabric that you hope will be interesting and will form something mm-hmm. good one day. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, as we chatted about, we met Father Ripperger, who was one of the uh, best known exorcists here in the States. And uh, some of his stuff we actually used in the picture, and he was well aware. Mm-hmm. Uh, jumping ahead to maybe an Easter egg that's not identified, when when Nefarious talks about um, when they talk about uh, a demon speaking in uh, that he's named in a Phoenician dialect that hasn't been spoken in thirty five hundred years, uh, where the inspiration for that was uh, Father Ripperger had a. Uh, Father Ripperger had an exorcism where the demon was speaking that Phoenician dialect. So there's that, Easter egg number one that we revealed to yeah, you. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and what was really crazy was they were able to back into what it was, but it had never previously been written down by any scholar or anyone else. They they could piece together what it was and like, oh, this is a new dialect that we've never quite seen this exact mm-hmm. flavor before. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's where they wound up. And then I'm I'm getting questions because when the DVD was released in August, uh, we re- we announced that we're going to begin work uh, on a sequel series for Nefarious as well, and I'm getting a ton of questions about that. Um, one of the questions I'm getting is, um, well, how's that going to work? How are Sean and Jordan going to come back? <laughs> we all watched Sean get electrocuted at the end, and I had somebody even tweet me this morning on Twitter, "You guys, don't you dare retcon that execution! <laughs> like, don't punk out!" And I'm like, "It's not going to be retconned." Nope. Um, I think we actually have from the last conversation we have. I think we actually have a very cool idea of how to do that. But yes. now's not the time to uh, to reveal that. Obviously. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, but okay. it, but it requires Sean. Yes, it does require Sean. Yeah. And it requires Jordan. It does. Sean Every and episode. Jordan will be back. Yes. yes. All right. So let's get to some Easter eggs. All right, Let, let's get to a couple of things I've been asked about if they were Easter eggs that are not, okay? The, and, and, and I was, I'm really, this is a compliment that I think people thought that we could pull, you guys could pull this off in the filmmaking or even in the editing process where uh, Brian Smith is concerned, that, that you could manufacture this into an Easter egg. <laughs> but, but I have actually had numerous people ask me, if the formation of the flock of birds... I knew you were going to bring up the birds. So you guys have been asked this too? Yeah, if the people are obsessed with the birds. Yeah, if, the, if the formation of the... Because I've got people looking for Easter eggs in this movie everywhere and every nook and cranny. If the formations of the flocks of birds that they see in the film... They, they're in one fl- one formation in one scene, and then they're they in the opposite formation in another scene. Uh, is that an Easter egg in some way, shape, or form? Okay. Of course. We totally did that on purpose. Chuck stood out in a field and threw yeah. bread from both ways. <laughs> to borrow from Bismarck, those with a fondness for sausages and movies should not watch them being made. So I'll, I'll, spill, this, I'll, spill, the, I'll spill the beans on B-roll, okay? The concept of B-roll. And B-roll is this. When you're actually shooting with your stars, you have this enormous crew. You've got 75 people. You've got 25 vehicles. You've got everything from honey wagons to... Well, you can't spend your time going and getting beauty shots. So two weeks after we're there, we send a cameraman and, and an assistant, and they go start taking 
random shots of the prison that we'll be able to drop in. Mm -hmm. Now, so the birds, that's when the birds showed up. So they weren't even there when we were, well, presumably they were there somewhere, but we didn't photograph them. And then the other one, if you want an Easter egg on the way in, um, there's this, for the establishment of the prison, there's this beautiful drone shot and it, it's flying in and it's a loving shot. And yeah. It's the whole big prison. Okay. So let me tell you how that started. So with the B-roll, the guy was also a drone pilot and he got a drone shot. He actually got it in reverse. It was actually coming out. And there were other things in there that we didn't want in. So now when we reversed the, the shot and made it a coming in as opposed to a going out, the, the going out was useless. We had people walking backwards, cars moving backwards, and those got erased. Yeah. The one thing that didn't get erased, if the you birds. want to look at it, no, um, if you look in the foreground, there are white tables and white chairs. That's where the crew had lunch. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and nice. breakfast and, and dinner. Nice. Yeah. Right outside the prison where you would never put and tables like, and yeah, chairs. Why are like, craft service right. tables there? All right, let, let's deal with the question that I get asked the most, and then we'll go down a, a list of, of, of topics that I that I, I prepared for us. The number one, because I, I, I let people put up questions on my Facebook page this morning and on my Twitter account this morning. Overwhelmingly, the number one question people have, all right? I've been asked this at speaking events. All right, I did a, I did a, a, a dinner uh, for a group of, uh, of Catholic uh, businessmen and their wives uh, back home in Des Moines uh, about three weeks ago, uh, who are all big fans of the film. And when it got to the Q&A, this was the first question they asked, okay? And so the name James Martin, this has been asked a ton, okay? And is, is this a specific reference to somebody? And the answer is, well, the official answer is that my middle name is James. My middle name is Martin. And your middle name is Martin. I despise it. And yeah. that's the story we're sticking yes, to. Yes, yes. And that's then the story the, we're and then, sticking to. And then it. see the disclaimer at the end of every movie. Yes. yes. Our, it's it's well, you know, coincidental. Go, yes. Going back to God's Not Dead when we did that one, the main character's name is Josh Wheaton. And everybody afterwards was sure we were looking to do a riff on the name Joss Whedon from the industry. We're like, yeah, no, we're not. <laughs> we wanted, we wanted the, uh, we wanted the most evangelical, clearly definable evangelical first name we could think of. Yeah. And out of our last like fifteen scripts, twelve have had characters starting with J. In the old days, it was J Jack. Then it went to Jim, and now it's Josh. Uh, so, and then you, Wheaton is a last name, is a very evangelical sounding Wheaton last College, name too. You know, yeah. so that's yeah. what we said. So well, like, what is the most clearly definable evangelical name we can possibly? I mean, jo Josh is Jesus, right? Is yes, the, is the root. So yep. this was the most, and then and then there was this big conspiracy thing of they're they're make, they're making fun of they're they're riffing on Josh Josh Wheaton. And we're like, not deliberately, we're not. <laughs> All right, let's start at the beginning then, all right? Um, and then if we get through this, and if we have time, I'll go back and look and see what other questions people had that we didn't get to. But overall, the, the question about the name James Martin is the number one question I have been asked when it comes to Easter egg questions. All right, let's start at the very beginning with Dr. Fisher's office, all right? What's in there that people should know or see? Uh, if you look real closely, it's tough to see on the, uh, the reflection on the left-hand side of the screen in the window there is uh, there's a spectral shape that's in there. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to tend to see it as the viewer, but it's going to tend to kind of in influence you that there's a you're little off in here. It up, but basically, yeah, it's yeah. very, very subtle. I mean, I, I can go looking for it, and I might not find it, but uh, it's there. We've, uh, that's, that's a CGI ad. Additionally, in that sequence, the picture tilting... That was not in the script, mm -hmm. and we did not shoot I remember that. when you guys called me and said, hey, what do you think about this as an right. idea in post-production? And yeah. we were worried about that because our wonderful editor, a guy by the name of Brian Smith, who I can't recommend enough, he's a brother, I mean, uh, definitely talented dude. He cut that and moved it back and he forth. He came up with the story idea. He and he came up with the story idea, which was amazing because basically we were concerned that it would let everybody know this is a demon. Right. And we wanted to keep that. But for some reason, it doesn't have that effect. You know, people just loved it. They said, oh, this is creepy, mm -hmm. you know. And so we went with it. And, we were uh, supposed to have the guy, the doctor who commits suicide, we, we attempted to shoot a high fall. And the problem was we were limited logistically in our production. And became a low fall. It really wasn't long enough to make a good looking shot. So uh, the guy who plays the doctor, ironically, is a stunt man. He's never used to seeing his acting on screen. That usually gets cut. Yep. So we so we didn't use his stunt and we did use his acting. He did a really good job. And the only thing that remains of his fall is we doubled some of it for the, the guy falling past the window 
We actually stole the footage, and that's actually him. It was all composited together. But what we intended to use, we didn't use, and what we never intended to use. Well, it was 4 was... o'clock in the morning. It was minus 20 degrees in Oklahoma. We're on a 50-floor skyscraper, and we only got like a 20-foot drop, and everybody's frozen. We can't even feel our fingers. Mm-hmm. And so we said, you know what? Um, maybe we've shot this like 20 different times, but the 20-feet drop is not going to change. So we just yep. we constructed in such a way that he passes by the window. The funny part about that, which people don't know, is that when he screams— we said to Mark, the guy who is playing the psychiatrist, so we need you to scream. So just do it on uh, your iPhone uh, and just scream, you know, ah, whatever. Mm-hmm. So he sends us three, four takes, and he can't scream properly. He sounds like a girl. <laughs> he, he, he's like, big ah, bad ah, stunt ah. man. Yes. Right. Ah, ah, ah. Yes. And we're like, really? Yes. And so we go back to him like 23 times, and I'm the like, Mark. Just scream like you fell off a building. We had to literally piece it together. Well, well, his problem was he had to fake it. Mark is never happier than he is in midair. It doesn't scare him. Right. So, right. so it's just for him. He that's why he sucked so bad. He doesn't know fear. He's right. a man of no, with no fear. He, he, he thinks he's a pigeon. Yes. I mean, you know, so it's like he can fly. You but. want a full body burn? He'll, he's your guy. But but you yeah. want him to play? He's scared. He's not gonna. He's not gonna be much help. All right. Now an- another. Ob- this is kind of an obvious one for people, but maybe some of you didn't know. That is Glenn Beck's ne- voice that you hear on the radio as James is driving into the prison. Yep. So that's kind of a bookend because we close with Glenn doing the interview and we yep. open up. Uh, that might even be the first line of dialogue in our in the entire film is Glenn talking about this as a story on his radio program and James is listening to it, right? You, I believe it right. is. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And a little yeah. little Easter egg. Um, when he drives into the prison, we, we have this uh, fake riot outside, you know, of protesters both for and against capital punishment. Mm-hmm. Um, our first day of filming, our first morning of filming, uh, coincided with the annual meeting of the Oklahoma Board of Prison Directors. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And they didn't get the memo. <laughs> the warden knew, but they didn't get that. So they actually thought there was a full-blown riot in progress at, at the prison. And they shut down the prison, ac- our access to the prison we needed to shoot at for 90 minutes. So that was fun. We, we had to try and explain. Out. It's a movie. Yeah. And th- this was a real prison. Granite yeah. State oh, yeah. Prison. It's a real live prison is Granite, where we shot this. Granite State Prison. Granite, uh, Oklahoma State Reformatory, better known as Granite, because it's one of those places that they call it after the town. It's a town of 1,700, half of whom are incarcerated, and um, it has the dubious distinction of uh, 30, 40 years ago, it was the most deadly prison in the United States. When it was an open yard prison, uh, there were more deaths per capita there than any correctional institution in the United States. It wasn't hmm. even close. It was, it was crazy. A, it was because, a death factory. I mean, there were times when we were 20 feet away from fenced in guys who basically have done, I mean, one guy was a cannibal, another guy was a serial killer. I mean, it's... It's crazy. Yeah, you we shoot, you're to, rolling film, and twenty. you can feel the evil. Yeah, if, we, if you look at the scene where out in the prison courtyard where um, where the warden is standing speaking ta- and in the sunshine, uh, well, we turned it cloudy in post, and Jordan is sitting on the bench, and he's kind of wondering, like, he's kind of a little rattled. Uh, Video Village, which is where the, the name for all the monitors and stuff while we're watching this scene. So we're about... 20 yards away from what's what's being shot Mm -hmm. about 10 or 15 feet behind us through a window there's a guy who apparently killed about five or six people and ate them oh wow and he's looking through the window so yeah that's a that's a through his window slit it's a A little easter egg as well if you look at the far wall they they paint the bottom eight feet white because when a prisoner tries to escape he'll stand out Mm -hmm. and one of the prisoners in the shot somebody tried to escape a couple of you that's where he was shot, literally against the wall. The blood splatters on the wall. I mean, it, it, you're in a real place. This is not, this, that was not make-believe. Yeah, it's a real yes. prison. All right, we've got nine and a half minutes. Let me get to some of the more theologically specific ones. Is that, what is the scarf of the, the priest that is called in? Ah, uh, that is it. Well, we, we wanted a, a, a statement that was more of a cultural, liberal, progressive statement. A way to define that priest as a social progressive immediately. Mm-hmm. And that is actually. And I think we achieved that. I think we achieved that. Yes. I, I, we asked for something that looked. I've seen knit, knit uh, stoles that are uh, usually South American. Uh, it wasn't meant to be uh, anti. Uh, it wasn't meant to have a sexual con- connotation to it. I wanted a cultural. We wanted a cultural one. Yeah, we want them to be a little. That's priest. actually yeah. that's actually a Unitarian Universalist stole. Right. Is what that is. Right. But it worked. So. But it worked perfectly. Um, let's go to Nefarious's cell. What's the writing on the wall? 
Oh, well, there's a lot of it. Right. But the but the primary, you get a little glimpse of the Greek behind him, and it says, uh, it translates as, does Job fear God for nothing? And uh, there's some Fibonacci sequences, there's a melting clock, uh, there's, there's, there's time at five to midnight, which we is usually the We have the devil falling out of heaven. Symbols. And we, yeah, we have like... The, the, the fall the angel of Lucifer with the from wings. heaven, yeah. uh, the falling angel that Led Zeppelin kind of co-opted for their, mm-hmm. uh, their... In the old days, when you watched the spinning record, you would watch the angel fall spinning from heaven uh, on your turntable, If you're for those of us that are ancient. The final words Nefarious speaks in the film, well, that Nefarious speaks um, as James, or I'm sorry, as Eddie in the film mirror the exact final words uh, that Nefarious speaks in the book and Nefarious plot as well. Mene, mene, to kill a parson. And that, of course, is a direct reference to the to Daniel. Yeah. And the it's Farsi for you have been weighed, measured, and found wanting, or weighed in the balance. Literally the writing on the wall, yeah. Yeah, the, and then so that's what he says to James, but then kind of really, just since James is kind of a stand-in for for culture at large, you know, right. uh, then that's kind of what he is saying to America there from uh, from the electric chair, similar to what he says at the end of the book. Yeah. He's condemning James and he's condemning America and mm-hmm. saying, you know, we're not done. But if you stay to the end of the movie, to the credit roll, right. and you let the credit roll roll mm-hmm. after uh, Sean laughs at the top of the credit roll and you let all the credits go, then Sean speaks at the final, final end of the credits. And he opens up with many, many tekel many, many parsons, which is you've been weighed and found wanting. Uh, mm-hmm. But you were too stupid to realize, realize it. I'm butchering the Latin, I'm sure. And then yeah. it says, continuandum est, which is to be continued. To be continued. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, we had one of the security guards on set is an actual exorcist. Yes. Yes. And uh, another one of the security guards worked for, works for the Babylon Bee. That's that's yeah. absolutely that's yep. an interesting pairing that you guys yeah, came up with. Yeah. Yeah. An exorcist and a, and a guy that works for the Babylon. Yeah, game. Jared, the guy who's who's playing the not too bright guard who's in the portal that gets asked for the cell phone. Yeah, he, we he uh, he did a nice job for us in a, in, in a role in uh, Unplanned. And yeah, we put him in several of our movies. He's kind of our good luck charm, and uh, he came. We said, <laughs> you know, we ha- we've got a, a small small role. This is basically a two hander. There's not a lot of roles, but we'd love to have you. Mm-hmm. He said, I'd like to come, and he came and. I, he did. He just. Uh, he just. He, he didn't even talk to us about how he's going to play it, and he just did a really nice job. Mm-hmm. Tell us about the Exorcist security guard because he's one of the security guards we see take Nefarious <sighs> to the death chamber. Yeah, when you watch him. Okay, so that's Father Darren Merlino. He's a. Um, he's he's an order priest. He actually stayed with us during the shooting. We knew we needed protection. We had two prayer teams. We had a husband and wife evangelical team. We had Father Darren, who was Exorcist trained actually trained by Father Ripper Group. Group. Um, and one Sunday night, he says mass, because schedules are irregular, about 10 p.m. in our house. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're all getting ready to go to bed. His sister-in-law was there, his brother and his sister-in-law. And she said, uh, Darren's sick, Darren's... And, and, I, and we were so tired, we I didn't even notice. I'm like, oh, yeah, he had some bad... He thinks he had some bad dinner. That's what he thought. Well, four hours later, he was uh, having an emergency appendectomy, and his appendix burst during removal. And the... Uh, the surgeon told him if you were here an hour later, you'd be dead. Wow. So when you see him, so when you see him manhandling uh, Nefarious to take him to the execution chamber, about 72 hours earlier, he had his, his, his appetite. Yeah, and he made. wanted to, he wanted to be in the movie. He wanted to do it, but he risked ripping his stitches and wow. stuff, but he still manned up. He's six foot five. Yeah, he's, he's a big a, dude. He's a big he's, dude. He's a big and, dude. You know, he was yeah. great with us, but the story that most of the time doesn't get told is a story where we're in the house, father is doing mass on a table, and we come back from set, and my boy says, Daddy, somebody broke into the house. The place is trashed, and we see that the fireplace is open. And something has come through the fireplace. The glass doors have been pushed And open. I'm like, this is weird. And on the fireplace, I had, uh, you know, the nativity said Jesus and all really powerful mm-hmm. stuff. But we also had Frosty for my lip, for my son and mm-hmm. Rudolph and stuff like that. we're filming this at Christmas time. Right. Yeah. It was Christmas. Yeah. And so, and I flew him out for that. Well, what happened was, and this is going to sound crazy. People don't believe this. They think I'm joking. A squirrel came down through the chimney. Now, how that happens, I don't know. And cut and gets pushes open the doors, and those doors don't open easily. Crawls up, knocks off Jesus and and the Virgin Mary and the Nativity and the baby Jesus. 
breaks everything, everything with that would be considered holy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, does not touch Rudolph or or Frosty or the 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 Christmas balls. Yep. Jumps off there, gets onto the couch, jumps onto the table where uh, Father would do mass, and basically dese- desecrates the table. Uh, craps on the paten, which is the plate where the host of the body of Christ is kept, Mm -hmm. and also pees in the right top and bottom left corner. Food is everywhere on a movie set, and we have food everywhere. Not one thing. We searched the whole house, and since it was a B and B, so and then he goes back up the chimney. Now you tell me, is that unusual? I mean, this was the kind of thing we had every day. It was unbelievable. So I I know we're not going to get to them all. The itemization of the, 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 the possession process, where does that come from? Oh, that's Father Ripperger. Father Ripperger. Yeah. Yep. And what I've, what I've been what really pleased with is other people at, across all denominations, they're recognizing like, yeah, this is the process. We, mm-hmm. may, we may name it differently or not at all, but this is how you fall into, into possession. This is what it looks like. All right. I've got about a minute plus here. What's, what's a theological Easter egg that I didn't ask you about that you th- want to highlight for the audience? That's a great question. A smarter man than me would have a ready answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, that is my picture on the screen of the guard bay, but that's not theologically inclined. No. Um, well, no, sure it is. Yeah. But uh, I think, you know, we tried to reveal the fact that there is the devil and there's God. There is good, there is evil. And I think that one of the things that we've had people come up to us, they say, I didn't, this is truth. It's just pure truth. Mm-hmm. And I've never seen something where it's, Everything you said, every priest comes up to us and says, this is exactly the way it works. This is the movie as far as exorcism. That's what's been revealed to us after the fact is that everyone who's in this deliverance field says, this is what I see. We have priests giving penance. They come up and tell us, people come up and tell us that priests are giving penance to go see the movie. Mm. That's for Catholics, obviously. Guys, great work. And I mean, I continue to get in incredible feedback from people around the country and in my inbox. So thank you guys very much and uh, look forward to more. All right. We'll come back and we'll have more uh, three non-political questions when we when we return. Stay tuned. Are you paying attention to uh, some of these unsettling headlines International threats, corruption here at home. You know, I was talking to Steve Baker as he was finishing his conversation with us last hour. To me, the scariest part of the whole January 6th narrative is that the people pulling this knew all along this footage existed. They were so confident in their own corruption that the footage would never see the light of day, even if Republicans got control of Congress. Think about what that means, by the way. Just going to do things out in the open now. Even if, even if it's on camera, we don't care. You know, you might want to consider that three-month emergency food kit from my my Patriot Supply. Just you know, just in case, just in case. It's it's better to have something like that handy and not need it than when you need it not have it handy. All right. Uh, this is breakfast, lunch, dinner, even drinks and snacks. The full complement of the two thousand plus calories that you need each and every single day. Uh, and and there's well over a dozen different types of meals and sides, so you can mix and match as well. It stays good for up to 25 years with proper storage. You get free shipping, uh, and you can save $200 on your food security right now. $200 off if you order by 3 p.m. at prepare. You'll get to same day shipping for free. Even if you order by 3 p.m., same day shipping for free. Preparewithdace.com is where you want to go. That's preparewithdace.com. Once again, preparewithdace.com. It is now time for three non-political questions. We all have questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Who am I? A search and a question of identity. Why am I here? A question of meaning and purpose. Where am I going? A question of destiny. Some better than others. What sort of morality or proto-morality would you expect to find in a chimpanzee troop? Injecting some levity into the demise of Western civilization. It's three questions on the Steve Day Show. Indeed it is, and back there sitting in my seat, don't get comfortable. <laughs> you know, you always say that, but I'm uh, I'm starting to sit in this seat a little bit more usually now. People will see that. You know, when yes, I came in, I forgot I, you were going to not be here, and Aaron was like, oh, go ahead and sit in Steve's seat. 
And I kind of just thought you were like in the bathroom or something. So I was like, uh. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's, that you, that's <laughs> why you asked. That's oh. why I hesitated. Oh. I hesitated because I was like, yes. I don't really know if I want to be sitting here when he comes in. <laughs> that's why I hesitated. No, I, I, Princess, I am, I am preparing that seat for you to, uh, uh, to assume it one day. But today is... It's not, not yet that, that day. day. You are, you are not yet, not yet that day. You are borrowing it for now. Good to see you, sweetie. How are you? Good. We had our uh, halfway point twenty week anatomy scan yesterday, so that went really yeah. well. She looked good in true Dace fashion. She shook her butt at the camera and was very stubborn and did not want to <laughs> <laughs> pose for any pictures or anything. We needed her. The nurse was not very happy because and she just sat like this with her like fists up. She was not in a good mood. So it kind of, it just, nice. but I was like, very that nice. is a true day at heart. Yes. We are all very, very excited. I, I mean, I, I mean, I've, I've heard from a lot of people down here in Dallas that have, have asked me, Hey, how are she doing? Are you guys excited? And yes, we are very, very excited for the pending arrival of autumn Elizabeth here in early March of next year. Uh, and, uh, oh yeah. And yeah, her mom's okay too. <laughs> all right. So you, uh, you've got uh, the questions handy, three non-political questions, and we've prepared a bonus since there's no Todd and we all know how much he likes to talk. So we may need to fill more time because Todd's homesick today. So you have a fourth bonus question for us, just in case princess, you may fire when ready. All right. My first question for you guys is what is a moment in your life that God used to remind you he is God and you are not? Um, Aaron, you know, I'll take this one first because there's a million of these moments that I have been reminded of this a million, but one of my favorites, most of the time when you learn this lesson, it is painful or, or cringe. The one I'm about to tell you is cringe. Okay. But you guys know, I, I, I live in cringe. I'm good with cringe. I'm okay with it. I embrace the cringe. All right. And so, um, I met Mike Huckabee's. Uh, victory party on caucus night 2008 and Huckabee is doing all these uh, interviews with national media after winning the caucuses and there's a whole line of people waiting to see him at his event and and because Huckabee's not there a lot of them start coming up and talking to me and taking pictures with me this is kind of the first time I you know was was given credit for something you know of, of significance here in the community and uh and I mean, it, you know, you know how much I've hated the term local celebrity and I've always <laughs> hated that stuff growing when you as you were growing up. But I mean, I mean, I, people are taking pictures, thanking me for what I did. I'm the reason Huckabee won and all this kind of stuff, you know, and um, we get to the end of the night and Mike finally gets done doing all these national TV interviews. And there's still this massive throng of people waiting to see him and to meet him. And, and he finally comes over to this group. And takes a lot of pictures and shakes a lot of hands. And he's going to get on a flight, a, a charter flight, and go right to New Hampshire for the New Hampshire primary that, that very evening, you know. And he turns to walk away. And then he turns back around and says to me in front of this entire group, Scott, thank you so much for what you did. We couldn't have done it without you. Okay. And man, if you could have, if you could have seen. The jaws of these people. It was like everyone just went horse face. Like they couldn't believe it, you know. And 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 your mom just froze, you know, waiting to see how I was going to react. And I got to tell you, I, I burst out laughing. I, I, I just burst out laughing. And on the way out to the car, and it was really cold. It's the dead of January. And on the way out to the car, I said to your mom, I'm going to remember this moment the rest of my life, man. This is, this is, I have no idea where my career is going to take me. I didn't know I was going to write a best-selling book or three or make a movie or work for a national media platform or any of that. I'm just a local guy in Des Moines at that time. And I'm only two years out of doing sports talk radio for a living. And, uh, and I, I said to your mom, walking out in the cold, you know, I, I'm going to remember this night the rest of my career. This was a night that God reminded me, you ain't all that. It ain't about you. Okay? You didn't do jack squat. Make sure you remember that because this thing can get embarrassing and cringe at a moment's notice if you don't. You know? And so I've been, that is, that is, there's been lots of moments where God has taught me this lesson. Most of them have not been fun. Uh, but that one was. And so I'll share that one. So I think for, for mine recently, and there's, there's been several moments, you know, and several sagas, as, as Steve kind of alluded to, where you can look back in your life and say, God's hand of providence 
was was working and you couldn't see it at the, at the time. But I guess recency bias in my mind is um, when my wife and I first got married and, and I don't want I don't want this to sound like a Joel Osteen type of physical blessing type of 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 statement but I'll, I'll explain why we lived in um we lived in an apartment in west des moines about two minutes away from your house steve actually nice apartment but when we found out that we were uh, going to be blessed with a uh, a new uh, a baby in in ben in our uh, in our life we decided hey we got to get something a little bit bigger here so we looked around found this town home uh in also in west des moines and it was bigger and uh, gave us a little bit more space to, to spread out. And it was a really good deal on, on renting. And so we moved in there. And about six, min- six months or so into renting that, we'd had Ben, started getting, it was a private, uh, private uh, landlord's, started getting some calls. Hey, uh, we're going to be, you know, somebody's going to be coming by to do an assessment on the place. I'm like, oh, that's weird. Uh, somebody's going to be coming by to uh, to to fix uh, this place, uh, or something. Or I I couldn't remember. And then all of a sudden, there were like a stream of people who were coming in to like do repairs and do assessments and things like that. What's going on here? And we finally got the call from our landlords that said, "Hey, we're going to sell the place, and either you can buy it or basically got to move out." And Bella and I really wanted to buy a house someday, but this was not on our timeline whatsoever. This was not according to our plans. And um, we, were, we were quite frankly very pissed about this, that we had really moved in, we had settled in, and then really less than, you know, it was six to eight months, we were having to kind of schedule our lives around when these inspectors were gonna be coming in and when these assessments were gonna be coming in. It was just kind of, it, it, it really irked us. Um, but it, you know, it, it forced us to say, hey, we got to move up our timeline in, in, um, in, in housing for the future. And we don't want to rent again. We want to start building equity. And um, we found a place that was basically perfect for us. We did. And um, if we had gone on our timeline, I don't know if we'd ever own a house at all, ever have a house at all. So that's a, I mean, it's, it's a physical blessing, but it's an example of, I think God's hand was moving us because we want to have more kids as well in the future. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. if we were stuck renting right now, I don't, I don't believe we would ever be able to have any upward mobility as far as that's concerned. Yep. Given the market, you're probably right. Before we get to question number two, that you want to talk about uh, security. Uh, this is where our friends over at Trust and Will comes in. Um, trust and will will help you uh, to, maintain, to maintain control of your assets, to ease the burden on your loved ones with an estate plan that can ensure your family stays prepared and protected. And, you know, traditional estate planning, it can cost thousands of dollars. And, you know, one size fits all templates may not capture all the important details that you have built your life around. So with trust and will, you can protect your legacy from the comfort of your home for starting at just 159 bucks. Uh, Amy, I had Amy do this for our family because we were actually just about to update all this stuff on our end uh, as well now with the kids getting older and grandkids on the way. And so it was perfect timing for us. And she raved about um, just the customization and, and accessibility of going through the trust and will process. So they've simplified it for creating and managing your will and trust online from finding out what's right for your family to finalizing it documents with a notary gain peace of mind today with trust and will, and you get 10% off plus free shipping of your estate planning documents by visiting trust and the, the word and trust and slash days. That's trust and slash days. That's 10% off and free shipping at trust and will.com slash days question two all right second question is rate these three fall themed dad jokes on a scale of one to ten ten being oh that's really really funny and one being that's really really horrible so first one confidence but go ahead (laughs) first one what's the ratio of an orange gourd circumference to its diameter i'm already at a three but go ahead finish (laughs) answer pumpkin pie I'm still at a three. <laughs> it's I'm at a so three. cringy, actually, and so bad that I'm at a ten. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the second one. What is a fire's least favorite month? No ember. No ember. Is it better if I say it like that? No ember. Quicker. That's 
It actually I'm makes at it a three a plus. I'm, I'm at a, I'm at a three plus. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm at a one. Aaron. Yeah. Okay. This three last... is the worst, right? Three is your worst. Isn't three your worst in your grading scale? Then give three is the worst. Oh, well then three. Oh, it's one to ten. Okay. All right. Oh, one to ten. Okay, then I'm I'm at a then I was at a ten at the other one. I'm at a ten at this one. They're 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 both pretty bad. Yeah. Okay. And then the last one, I actually kind of think this one's kind of funny, so I'll be kind of upset if you don't. The last one is, how are you supposed to talk in the Apple library? <laughs> I don't know why I think this is so funny. With your insider voice. Get it? Because of insider, cider, C-I-D-E-R, apple cider. With your insider voice. I saw this you and I actually laughed. I really did out in the lobby. I laughed out loud. I thought that was actually wait, 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 wait. Where did I go wrong as a father? It just was clever, I thought, with your insider voice. I guess I don't, I don't know why I keep saying it. Like, you guys are going to end up laughing. It's not going to happen. <laughs> the only part of it that I think is funny is that you think it's funny, actually. I actually really, I kind of thought it was funny. Maybe that's just like my mom starting to like come out. Maybe these are more, maybe that's coming out, my I, parents. I thought dad jokes would be like, you know, when they're seven, eight, nine, ten years old. Dude, the other day, Ben came over to me and I'm tired and I like it was I was like possessed by some other force I was like hi tired I'm dad <laughs> your, your grandmother Vicky did that to me once as a kid I was I kept asking her for there was a very popular candy out called now and now or laters or now and laters and I kept asking her for some and she turned and looked at me and said you are annoying me so much you can't have any can- candy now or later <laughs> And then we and then and then we both looked at each other and started laughing out loud because we thought it was actually very funny. Yes, true story. All right, before we get to question three, you know, there's an organization out there that still backs Obamacare, gun confiscation, trannies, endangering our children, open borders, and they claim to be bipartisan, and yet 95% of their donations went to Democrats. That organization is AARP, and they don't represent American seniors. Fortunately, you've got an alternative, AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens, proudly championing your rights to free speech, religious liberty, the Second Amendment, and more as the leading conservative advocacy and benefit its organizations for seniors in the country. They're pushing back against the efforts to defund the police, weaken the borders, and indoctrinate and corrupt the next generation. With more than 2 million members nationwide, you can join this pro-faith, pro-family, pro-freedom organization and get access to special low rates on cell phones, plans, health and wellness products, travel, lodging, vision, dental, even prescription drugs if you join today. All right, send a strong message. AARP doesn't represent your values. AMAC does. Join AMAC today. AMAC.us slash Dace, A-M-A-C dot U-S slash Dace, A-M-A-C dot U-S forward slash Dace. All right, last question. Go ahead. And then my last question is, what is one of the hardest times you've had with your faith and how did you overcome it? Opening night with Nefarious, box office was very disappointing, Um, had, had been through you know, two literal near death experiences with this film. And uh, it's the it's really the it's the, it's the first time in my faith journey that I contemplated letting going the rope. I mean, I was in an, a pretty deep hole, a pretty deep hole. And uh, um, a friend of mine uh, that your mom got on the phone, and because I wouldn't take any calls, so he she put him on uh, her phone uh, so that I'd have to listen. Uh, a, a pastor by the name of Mark Driscoll called and uh, uh, got me out of a deep pit. And uh, and confronted me in that pit and uh, with some things I needed to hear. But I would say that was the moment. I mean, to go through everything we went through to make this movie, to nearly die, and then, you know, to see the movie not instantly become a hit. I mean, my, my I was at a real, real low point in my faith journey with that. I, I, that would be it. I'd say when I was single and um, really wanted to get married i mean uh there were some breakups that were very very difficult and much like with uh, another scenario when i was much younger in life when <laughs> i was getting bullied and picked on when i was a freshman on the, on the on the football team in high school i just one to one with god i said you know what i accept this this is i'm small i'm puny right now this is what i am and then i had my growth spurt <laughs> like 2 months later uh, I just accepted, you know what, I'm going to enjoy the gift of singleness. And then it was, I, I kid you not, it was about two months later that I met Bella. 
Wow. That, that'll preach right there, brother. <laughs> that'll preach right there. Good questions, Princess. Thank you Thank very you. much, sweetheart. Thank you. Hey, Aaron, are gonna stick, Aaron and I are going to stick around and do overtime for Blaze TV subscribers. You didn't get a buy, seller hold this week. So we're going to give you a bonus buy, seller hold on a Thursday in the overtime today at blazetv.com slash dace. Go there to become a subscriber today. For the rest of you, we'll see you tomorrow. Until then, John 317.